Please welcome back to the stage, fresh off the Ron Paul campaign, your host and MC, Mr. AJ Schnack. Thank you, Scott. Um, thanks for all your hard work. And I, I wish it was only Ron Paul, but uh, it, was, uh, it was the full contingent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, come on into to the hall, have a seat. Uh, for those of you who are still chattering like uh, rude people who have, were never took manners classes, um, you can either class. move out or we'll shut the doors. Uh, but we're gonna have a great show for you tonight. It's Silver Docs tonight, this is night two. We had a great night last night. Um, now, now I feel like I'm gonna... Hold on one second. We had the same problem last year as well. Already. I'm sorry. Let's move your conversations either out or come on in. Everyone, either come in or move your conversations away from the door. Thank you very much. We're going to have a great show tonight. We had a great night last night. Please welcome our bartender, our mixologist for the evening, Mr. Ryan Harrington. Thank you. How are you? I'm well, Mr. Shock. How are you? I'm very well. And what, so good what, to see you. What, what are we making tonight? Um, well, it's a little concoction um, um, to, to, to honor our guests. Um, you know, Eugene Hernandez and I share um, a love of margaritas in common. Yes, um, indeed. And I, I just came back from a trip from, from Morocco, where I bought some lovely curry. And um, I'm not sure what uh, Mr. Jarecki likes to drink, but I'm hoping he likes vodka. Because we don't have tequila, so we're going to have a vodka curried huge. Um, Fantastic. And I could sounds make one amazing. if you'd like, or I, I'll just... Yeah, why don't you start, and okay. then we'll, uh, we'll have it as we go, and as the guests come up, as you know, because Ryan, you were an amazing I was. mixologist last year. I think you might have kicked off this fantastic tradition <laughs> of ours. <laughs> and at least now like. they've gotten you a cutting board and a, I, and a proper knife, a proper because knife. Uh, last night Judith Helfen was using uh, a pocket knife and the table. Well, Judith Helfen with anything sharp could be dangerous. <laughs> it is, so I, um, it is very, yeah, it's it is probably, very dangerous. It's probably for the best. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's start the show. Seriously, if I could have some help um, with the outside, that would be fantastic. Um, and please welcome our first guest tonight. Um, the, the filmmaker is here this year with his new film, The House I Live In. Please welcome Eugene Jarecki. Yeah, very nice. You should have that ever. You should have that, that everywhere. That plays wherever I go. Um, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's good to have you. You've already done a little talking today. I feel like uh, a little bit. This is sort of the uh, the extra bonus conversation that no. one finds in the in the secret Easter egg on the DVD. It was all a rehearsal for this moment yeah. here. At your... Um, so uh, tell us a little bit of the new film. You're, you're, um, I, I, you've been on. You were at Sundance. You won the, the grand jury prize. As uh, you, you've ruined Andy Timoner's uh, dream of being the only person to ever win the grand jury prize twice. Um, so that that in and of itself is uh, is something I think that <laughs> should go should in your celebrate. obit. <laughs> um, Sorry. So what's what's been happening since then? I actually got to see your film in Los Angeles, uh, and that was great. So tell us tell us where you're at with uh, House well, Element. What we've been doing with the film ever since Sundance is sort of correcting past mistakes. I learned the hard way with several previous movies that if, you're, if you read your own press releases too much and you think, oh, I won an award at a festival and I'm going to, you know, the sky's the limit now and I'll give it over to the distributors and leave it up to Jesus that they will, you know, pursue social change. You learn the hard way that that's not what they do for a living. No ill intention toward them. They do a commercial thing for a living and so the grassroots side of it the philanthropic side of it is something we spend all of our time on. My whole team and I have taken my, ourselves off of the grid of producing anything else now for the foreseeable future with the express purpose of just working this film and getting it out to audiences who are not typical documentary target audiences, getting it into churches and schools and working with partner organizations around the country to get the issues in the film about the American war on drugs uh, to more people's minds so that they know more about it, can make more informed choices about who they vote for uh, and about what kind of legislation they want to support or not in their district, in their community. Well, cheers to that. Cheers to that. Um, so that we have to, we have to, really try, we have to try the pouring, drink. To see that right. felt really weird to be pouring Grand Marnier um, floaters when you were the, talking oh, no. about That's, something so... I like that. That's interesting. I, of course, yeah. spilled it instantly on <laughs> <in> my shirt. <laughs> Um, Very yeah. good. So uh, I was thinking about you as uh, it really has th curry in it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, it's curry. Um, I had eaten, so it's a nice combination. As the news came out about um, you know the, the bi biography that was written about President Obama that showed that you know he had you know he was a, a big weed smoker, um, and uh, and and the fact that he but he won't relax the the drug laws around 
basically the thing that he did. So he's going to criminalize people for doing what he did and what President uh, George W. Bush did and what Bill Clinton did. I mean, when are we going to reach a point right. where, it, a tipping point where finally so many, I mean, obviously it's, if Romney wins, it's not going to be Romney because we're, then we're going back to people who he doesn't even drink. So like, right. when are we going to reach a point where people are going to stop criminalizing the behavior that they themselves did and that they must know in their heart isn't problematic? Sure. Well, I mean, I think to be fair to President Obama and those who came before him, they're all dealing with politics as usual which is ambush assassination politics here in Washington, where if you would even say remotely that you're favorable of softer penalties for drug use or drug sale, it's become tantamount to political suicide. I believe that's changing. I actually think Obama is behind the curve on this. If you look at who is coming out against the war on drugs, even Pat Robertson a couple of weeks ago has done so. You saw in New York City in the past week, the governor and the mayor of New York, um, both Cuomo and Bloomberg, both came out against the stop and frisk behaviors of the NYPD, which are so much a fundamental part of policing young people, pr primarily black and Latino young people, about whether they have marijuana in their pocket. So you see basically that this is a phenomenon. I mean, when you talk about the presidents, you almost get the sense, if you look at our most recent presidents, that there's a higher concentration of drug use among presidents than in the general populace. Well, it's been 100% so, over the last three years. Uh... Exactly. So it's strange that they should be in favor of ongoing criminalization. Um, the goal, of course, is to find a sane way of talking about what's wrong with this war on drugs, why it's so damaging to poor people, people of color, and now increasingly just poor people across the board, and get a constituency in this country to grow and grow. There is already a growing group in this country who recognize that this makes no sense. The interesting thing is that having spent more than a trillion dollars, having arrested 45 million arrests in 40 years at this point, drugs are cheaper than ever, they're more available than ever, younger and younger kids are using and selling them. So the war on drugs has failed implicitly on every index you could look for. The people who are often most smart and most vocal, and I hope that a bunch of them are, are come across to people in my film, are the insiders, are people within the system who look at it and can tell you from first-hand experience what is so pain, painfully wrong with what they're doing. Um, and yet they, of course, need the support of the public in order to pursue the kind of reform that will make it easier for someone like Obama, who is ultimately a political creature, for him to be able to look around and say, okay, it's safer for me to go out. I mean, we should look to leaders to lead, not follow. But, but I don't understand, that why, why doesn't he go, like, there's obviously this civil libertarian thing, you know, that Ron Paul, Rand Paul, that they exemplify, like, they, they've, they are clearly on the side yes. of, like, you know, getting rid of a lot of these laws. Why isn't he smart enough to go to those people and, and, and forge alliances with people who are, are civil libertarians in, in the Republican Party um, and, and talk about these issues? Instead, he's, he, um, it, it, to me, he's fighting this, the, 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 the 1994 law, uh, war. He is. He is. Uh, you know, and to say it fairly to the Obama team, and, and critically but, but gently critically, is to say that they are operating within the very tortured and eroded community of poor ethics that surrounds life in Washington. And so they wake up every morning to know that any false move can be exploited immeasurably and irreparably by their opposition, even if it's steeped in decency, even if it had all the markings of a reach across the aisle and everything else. So you have to ask yourself, what is it in their political calculus that is operating here? One of the things you'll notice about the Obama team, for example, Kirlikowski, who's his drug czar, made very clear when I interviewed him, I'm not a drug czar. I don't call myself a drug czar. And by the way, that's a wartime word, and we don't call this a drug war anymore. It's not a war on drugs. Well, that sounded good three or four years ago when I interviewed him. Yeah, stop sending the SWAT teams into like... Exactly. But if it's not a war, then stop conducting it as a war. And if all you're going to do is preserve the fact that it's a war, and in fact it's a war on people, because saying it's a war on drugs is like saying a war on terrorism. Well, yeah, then it's the it's, same thing as everything else where we don't declare war anywhere, but then we're, but we're still going in it. and like right. doing it. Right. Yeah. So I, I've ultimately come to believe that what they're doing is conducting war by another name, and that's become very much an unfortunate trademark in the Obama years of both Obama's team and also others around Washington that it's enough to say it. So they've come out and said very provocative things. And in fact, some measures of positivity have happened on Obama's watch. It's absolutely crucial to recognize that until Obama's administration, for some decades now, powder cocaine and crack cocaine, which are chemically the same drug, if anything, crack is just a sort of diluted form of the raw form of powder, um, those two drugs are not treated the same. 
as people may or may not know, crack is punished 100 times more severely than powder. So if you're walking down the street carrying crack and I'm walking down the street carrying powder, I need 100 times as much powder to get the same penalty you will get. Well, well now that Shoshana has done crack on girls, I feel like this is going to change exactly. like people's view of crack exactly. entirely. But it's really fair to mention that Obama, on his watch, <laughs> That crack powder disparity, fit people felt enough political cover to bring it from 100 to 1 down to 18 to 1. It's a Supreme Court result that now people could say that's ridiculous that it's 18 to 1, which it is since they're the same. But 100 to 1 to 18 to 1 has gotten a lot of people out of jail who were put there as nonviolent people, while violent people are put in jail for less time, which is, of course, the great scourge of the drug war. The, the disastrous stain on our psyche is that drugs are punished very often more severely the, it, sort of nonviolent drug activity is very often punished far more severely than violent activity in other spheres. And it's that which should change and why the Obama team is behind the curve on that is why most of American politics is behind the curve of the common sense of the American people. When you watch the American people polled on issues like should the rich be taxed, the American people say yes, the rich should be taxed. It's only once you get into the sort of through the looking glass warped reality of warped media discourse in Washington and New York and other major cities where you get to see, oh, it's not what I think it is, it's some other completely warped reality that I'm supposed to buy into. No, it's not. The American people, by majority, think the drug war should end. By majority, think that the rich people should be taxed and a bunch of other common sense notions. Let me um, step away from, uh, from that film for a second and, and go back to, to Reagan, which I, I really loved, and I, which I th actually thought could have been twice as long. Um, and if so, if there is a twice as long rough assembly version, will you please there send is. it to me? Because it's I on, it's already it. on your desk. Um, I'll get it yeah. to you. Um, because I'm fascinated, because I'm making a film about Republicans now, and I'm fascinated by, um, obviously, there's a lot of distrust, because as a, as a, as a community, we, we're not very Republican. Um, so I'm just I'm curious how, when you started making that film, was it difficult to, to say to people, like, no, this isn't going to be a hatchet job on Ronald Reagan? Like, I'm actually, I'm very interested in, like, um, talking to people. Or were, or were people, I mean, maybe, you, maybe you're just a lot more credible than I am, and people... Uh... <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, look, I, I've made a career out of making very carefully researched movies that, um, for example, with Why We Fight, Why We Fight didn't have a very partisan slant to it, because I myself don't know where I would find a party in this country. I don't believe in what the Republicans or the Democrats are doing with the American people and with our interests. And so it was easy with Why We Fight to find a hero in Dwight Eisenhower, who's a, by, by any standard, would be a moderate Republican, kind of a scion of Republicanism in the 20th century. Yet today, he's far to the left of Hillary Clinton, way to the left of Obama. And so when you look at a person like Eisenhower, and I made Eisenhower very much a hero of why we fight, a lot of people in the Republican common sense circles, and they're common sense members of both parties, like they're most of us in the public, um, those common sense representatives within the Republican Party saw my treatment of Eisenhower as fair and reasonable, and I think expected I would give the same kind of care to the way I would think about Ronald Reagan. At that time, people saw me, frankly, as kind of a moderate Republican, because I spent two or three years walking the country, basically dressed up as Dwight Eisenhower, because I loved Dwight Eisenhower, and I wanted more people to know his Did ideas. Did you shave your head? Um, <laughs> tops of heads. I'd have to kill you if I told you what I did. Um, well, see, I actually saw Why We Fight at, at True False, and you did, a, you did what may be the longest and greatest, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was theater. The, your okay. Q&A that night in the Missouri Theater, I mean, there was like 1,700 people, no one left. I swear it went on for like three hours. It did, yeah. And, and it, was, it was amazing. It and did. I love why we fight, but I have to say your Q&A was even better. I've had some of my Q&As compared to like Grateful Dead shows and stuff. Yeah, it was. They go on and on and people feel a little bit like they took something at some point during the <laughs> evening. Um, but I, I definitely uh, pride myself on on traveling with my films, and I love to hear what people have to say, and I take on a great deal. You know, when you represent the film, you come to here to Silver Docks, or you go around the country to small small festivals, and you go around the country to sort of small towns and stuff, uh, and not just in the cliched mom and pop small town, but even just like regular places, like not go to the capital of a state, but the sort of secondary line cities, uh, you get to hear a lot of people who have critical stuff to say about your movie, formative stuff to say about the issue, some way that your issue bit them at some point, and they want you to know that it's not as simple as you think it is. And you should see, it would be fascinating to do a time lapse of the way my own discourse about what I'm doing morphs as I get feedback like that. Because I take on, I'm like a kleptomaniac, you know, I take on whatever somebody puts before me, if it's got some common sense in it, it's gonna get sort of sucked into the vortex of what I'm trying to represent about my subject. So I become 
a messenger of a lot of people, hopefully, by the end of it. The people in my film, the people who talk in my film, the thinkers in my film, some of the critics of my film, and then ultimately audiences that I get to meet places like this. You know? And, so, and is, it that, is that in some ways, I mean, it's such a different experience when you're out talking about your film, uh, it, you know, when you're making films and you're getting to be in people's lives and you're like, you know, oh my gosh, if I wasn't a documentary filmmaker, I wouldn't get to be here answering, asking you this right. question. I mean, is, on some level, like, is one of them more fulfilling for you or? Um, uh, the most important thing in my life is to communicate about issues of common concern, political concern, social issues concern, social justice concern. Whether I'm doing it by sitting at an editing table, as you know very well, and smashing my head into a computer monitor, oh, yeah. <laughs> or whether I'm in the field trying to negotiate a parking space with a cop who wants to arrest me, or, 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 or whether I'm speaking about the film, they're all levels of that labor which is involved in getting crucial ideas out to the public at a time where circus and nonsense are what is commonly sold by the mainstream establishment, and we lucky few have the ability to have found a tiny little avenue for reaching people who we know in their hearts actually do want to consume substantive fare, and they do care about the future of the world, they do care if we're still gonna be here in 20 odd years. And if you care about all those issues, this field is a remarkable field to be able to do your movies in, but then of course there's this carry-on effect where you then get this tremendous reciprocity from audiences who just show you how much they've thirsted for that kind of Frankly, that's just kind of human connection that you reached out, they reach out, and you find a wonderful. You know, there's a great line from the history of theater when I was a stage director I took to a lot called Great Reckonings in Little Rooms. And I pursue that, whether it's with a movie playing or my voice or people connection to conversation like this. They're all great reckonings in Little Rooms. It's a weird gift that we get to like have, have like a, a lot thing. of interactions with people. It's a and, wonderful thing. Yeah, maybe it's the best thing about doing it. Sure, I know sure. you have to get to your screening. Your, your film is about to play like right now. Yes, so everybody come Anyone who has, yeah, please, just, just come. Just, just leave. Stay here. We'll, you can we'll miss the movie. The show. You can miss um, the movie. People tell my, you. My last weird question for you. Does anyone ever tell you how much they liked capturing the Freedmans? My brother's movie? Yes. <laughs> they do. They tell me all the time. In fact, a lot of people come up to me and say, I love your work. That capturing the Freedmans, that's your best film of all. And I go, yeah, it's my brother's film. Anyway, but it's good to meet you too, and I bet I can find something that your brother did, like some hockey game he won that you sat on the sidelines for because you had a broken hip, and I'll just credit you with that. But no, frankly, by now, I just say, thank you. It was a great pleasure to make the film. Right, and then you go to your brother and you say, yes, like, really yeah, someone told to me, me how shitty your, your film was. Those today. Friedmans, exactly. When I captured those Friedmans, I just, I knew, I really knew at that moment I'd, I'd, I'd broken the mold. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Eugene Jarecki. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Thank you man. Good to, Good to see you. Ryan, I like Don't it. forget your drink. Oh, yeah, take your curried, take your curried <laughs> huge. You should, and you should, <laughs> you should, you should talk about it as you intro the film also. And explain, explain the, the, the ridiculousness that's going on over here. Do you really like here. the drink? I really do like it. Yeah, no, it's like, it's... Is it, it better is, than Judith? It is a thing because we had those margaritas that were so sweet yeah. that this, it was like, it's savory, so it took me a moment. But yeah. now I'm, I'm really into it. Did you I make one really for yourself? I of course, I made one before the show started. It felt <laughs> really weird pouring Grand Marnier when he was talking about the drug wars. I didn't know what to say. I froze. No, I wanted to get high that whole conversation. <laughs> I was just like, Jesus, can we it's smoke It's like, something? thank God that powdered is like I know. less offensive than the real... I know. Do you, are you watching girls, by the way? I mean, I can't. I, I hate I to tried, like, obsess I, I, about I it. I can but. smell it. I can taste it in my mouth when I watch it. It makes me sick. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. You, you can smell and taste girls, or you can smell and taste like. <laughs> it reminds me. Okay, if you all, all honesty. <laughs> Which part is grossing you out more? The well, girls <laughs> or the or the crack? No, the show. The show itself. Oh, all not right. the crack, please. Whatever. The girls part. <laughs> girls. Um, no, it reminds me of this roommate I had in my twenties um, when I was like 22 and she always she was like that character on girls and she always used to throw she's up she's like Lena or she's like, like they're all the same um, she was um, she always used to pee when she was wasted on this Papa's on chair we had in our living room and like that's what, what that show reminds me of it was just like this wait 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 did she think it was the well, toilet no I mean when she was, was wasted problem? you know they're always just drunk and doing stuff I hate drunk girls sorry hi um, wow uh, I had a Papa's on chair too and thank god no, <laughs> no drunk girl ever she came and she threw up peed. on it a couple of times too Wow, I don't even. Actually, that show I, I brings back violent memories to me. I love that really chair, cool. but I have no idea. Shirley hated it, and I have no idea. I think she might have thrown it away <laughs> one time when I was on a trip, and like I was maybe like making a movie, I mean, and it, she was it, just it, like, "All right, you're gone." It does remind me of the college days. You know, it's, it's very college. It's very cheap. It was a cheap. It was not an expensive chair. Yeah, but it was cozy. 
They are cozy. Right? Yeah. Uh, please welcome to the show uh, someone who is like a, one of only 20-ish people. Like, there's, this is a very rare thing, who've been twice nominated uh, for an, an Oscar for Best Documentary. Please welcome wow. uh, Marshall Curry. Make me come alive, come on and turn me on. Touch me, save my life, come on and turn me on. I actually just figured out the curried part of the curry shoot. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, I thought that you had said something about Eugene Curry, and I thought maybe there's a Eugene Curry in New York that I'm unfamiliar with. Okay. Or your brother. Okay. How's your brother doing? <laughs> I love things. your brother's film. Good, good. I'm are you, I'm drink, sorry. Though. Are yeah, you on no, the show I'm with like, us? I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, don't talk about the drug war yeah, yet. Come on. Come on. Come on. Um, so you are on a jury. Here. Yes. Um, and I'm just curious because, you know, you, 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 when you started doing, how many juries have you done? Have you done a, like five, five 10, 15, five. 20? Yeah. Yeah. And when you first started doing juries, you want to taste this Thank first you. and see, see what you think? I'll wait. Do I squeeze this in? <laughs> you squeeze you can, it. Yeah, I, mean, I actually didn't squeeze yeah, mine. Squeeze yeah. Yeah, yeah, you should do that. No? The lime is actually... Oh, my God. The, <laughs> <laughs> the curry is on in your it's good. It's, uh, it's not good. You hate it. It takes a moment. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks, It's Amy. good. So, um, so you're on this jury. And so when you first started doing juries, obviously then you probably had been through the, the looking glass with Street Fight and um, you had that experience. And when you started doing juries, did it change your whole perspective of competitions and like how that whole process works? Uh, you know, this is a talk show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would say um, <laughs> that it, uh, no, not really. I mean, it gave me an insight into some of the sausage making that happens when you're done. And you kind of, everybody's got something that they care about. And, and ultimately, you know, maybe everybody's second choice wins. Um, but not always, so... Is that how you like to do it? Everybody's second choice wins? Is yeah, that what we usually we just go to on Saturday? Everybody, every, just, just submit your <laughs> The least choice, objectionable right. film is going to yeah. win on Saturday? No, well, I mean, you can argue for only so long, but when you right. have different opinions from people about what matters or what your style is or, or what things you care about. I mean, I've been on juries with people who care about the political message above all or care about, you know, what this award will do to the film above all or what's their favorite movie of the, of the group, or if that movie's already won a bunch of things. I mean, there's all that kind of stuff that, that can, you know, really sort of separate you. Right, and, and do you have a preference of how, do you, do you take the lead? Do you step back? Do you do, you do it differently each time? I, no, I'd say I don't take the lead. I'd say I generally step back and try to, you know, build a coalition with somebody and then... Right. Uh, Marshall was just on my jury for uh, the Gucci Tribeca documentary fund, actually. How did he do? He's... He was pretty wonderful. And he did step back, but he really did, like, he would undercut, you know? Just like, he would get in there when you would least expect it. Ask a question about... Ask about a question. The and, and it was actually, you did guide the conversation, but in a really... Really, um, you know, a way subversive that, way. Yeah, exactly. I think I, I think you're a little subversive, maybe. Like you're coming in and someone saying like, "I really like this," and you're like, "Really? Did you like that? You like that part? Huh? What'd you like about that?" I mean, I think juries. It's hard to be on juries though, if when you make films, because you know how hard they are, and you know that you can't control everything when you're making a film, and you know that people's opinions are different, and ultimately, I. I I mean, it's fun to get to have somebody pay for your train ticket and put you up and you get to watch a bunch of movies. But there's something that I actually don't like about being on juries. You know, when you're watching films, you're saying, is this exactly, you know, how does this compare to something else instead of just being able to purely enjoy what's great about all the films we've seen? So um, let's go off the jury topic for a second because you're, uh, I was thinking about you uh, recently as, as your man, Mr. Cory Booker, was... Uh, was so in the news, and, and here, here's this guy who you... You live by the sword, it, you, you die by the let's sword, say, yeah. you, you built this guy. Like, you created him. He, you, are the you are the Dr. Frankenstein, no, no, and no, he no, is I your monster. I just pointed a camera at it. Um, and, and, and I'm just, I'm, but I'm curious, when you're watching that and knowing him and spending, having spent a bunch of time around him, what was your take on, the whole, on, on that whole thing? Because it was so... Um, to me, it was such an interesting thing of somebody who's built, had, had constantly built up nothing but goodwill. Yep. 
Everybody likes him. Right. And then he just does this thing that seems so boneheaded yeah. and, then, and then follows it up with one boneheaded response after another. Yeah. Well, I mean, I felt like... He's probably your best friend and like, I'm now asking you to no, shit no, on no, him. No, 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 no. Uh, well, I mean, I understand the point he was trying to make, which is that political advertising has gotten horrible and, and the sort of general talk show way that somebody like him explains that is to say nobody's perfect and, and both sides have, have problems and blah, blah, blah. I think that was his larger point. And if you watch the whole clip, you know, he really hammers Romney and he really aggressively defends Obama's record before attacking this, this ad. And so I, I, I think there's a lot of, of, I was surprised by how negatively people reacted to it. He, but he would obviously take that, he, he wants that back. Like, he wants oh, that moment back, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was a disaster for him, no doubt. Yeah. And, and so, was that because, because people talked about it, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you to speculate, but people talked about the fact that he's so, um, you know, him and Christie, they're, they're connected, they get, a lot, they get money from, like, a bunch of people who are on Wall Street, like, there's a financial aspect yeah, to it. Is, so is that Obama. it? Obama. I mean, that was the weird thing. To me, the attack on him seemed sort of surprising. I mean, Obama takes money from all those same people. Like, there's nothing, I, I guess I don't have a problem with any politician trying to raise as much money from anybody that'll give them money as long as they're, they vote correctly or, they, or they, they stay strong on things. And, and you know, he's taken a lot of, of controversial positions, I think. Um, first of all, I'm not like I'm not his you're, spokesperson yeah, no, or anything like that. Yeah, no, seriously, you are. I, I hope someone's tweeting that yeah, press no, spokesperson for Cory Booker, no, no, Marshall no, 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 Curry, no, I mean, has, I disagree has completely with disavowed yeah, yeah, yeah. the uh, no, the statements made. No, but I disagree made. with him on a lot of things, and and but but I disagree. I, there's nobody in politics who I don't disagree with on a lot of things. But I do think that in one moment there was an, a, a really aggressive attack on him that I guess surprised me, given his progressive positions on almost every other He was issue. beloved, and then he did this thing, yeah. and it was like everyone just sort decided... Of, but there are a lot of people who've always not liked him f because of his relationships to Wall Street, because of his attempts to be bipartisan, because of his, you know, the things that he says positively about Republicans or, or the places where, you know, in his mind, he doesn't walk in lockstep with anybody. He, he's in favor of school vouchers and school choice and things like that, which is you know, considered horrible by, by many progressives. He's pro-gun control, he's pro-abortion rights, he's pro, very aggressively pro-gay marriage long before Obama was gay marriage. And I, uh, to me, I just sort of feel like you, you look at a politician and you say, do I agree with them more than I agree with somebody who's there, who, who could have their role? And if you do, you, you support them. But I don't even vote for him because I live in Brooklyn anyway. So let me ask you: so you, you, so you made you made that film about him. You made um, you made a film about teenage uh, race car uh, uh, drivers. You made a film about um, eco terrorists. Um, how do you decide? Um, I mean, those are those are awesome topics, and also like none of them are overtly. Um, I shouldn't say political. You're not like you're not out there like saving the world. You're like doing like poppy, poppy. You're doing poppy things that have a poppy. well, poppy. Yeah, like they, you know they, they're fun. Yeah. Like your, your movies are fun. Yeah. like they're enjoyable. Like I, I don't ever well, want to slit my fucking wrists yeah. watching a Marshall Curry all right, film. All right, well that's nice. Um, <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's a high bar you said. Yeah, that, I, that should be on your I'll next DVD. Yeah, that'll be on the cover. I don't ever want to slit my fucking <laughs> wrists. <laughs> and then you'll make a movie that I will. Um, but how do you choose? What, what do you? What? What's? What, what's your? Um, what's I mean, your I, bar? it's just something that interests me for who knows what reason. I mean, usually if there's like a, you know, I want it to have charismatic characters. I want there to be an arc. And I want it to be about some issue that seems complex to me. So it's almost always like something I don't know anything about. I didn't know anything about racing, very little about inner city politics, almost nothing about radical environmentalism before making the movies. But I had a lot of questions about those things. And so, um, and, 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 uh, and, you know, access and serendipity too. I mean, certainly for the street, for street fight and if a tree falls, those were like, you know, just something happened, and here's a story. Do you want to take it? Well, you Raising know, Dreams was no, an no. idea that I had that I'd been... I was interested in NASCAR as a phenomenon. 
I couldn't name two NASCAR drivers, but I thought it was interesting. Billy Bob. It's this huge thing. Yeah, and, it. Sorry. Um, and, uh, and, and so I wanted to Does that mean? find some yeah, way mean. to look at it. Sorry, I'm kicking my Republican credentials. <laughs> about, we got to get Eugene back here to help me like, to figure out how to dress like what, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Did he really? Let's, let's, did he shave his head, do we think? Because he didn't. Like, what do you say when he dressed? How do you dress like Dwight David Eisenhower? Sorry, go back to your NASCAR story. Yeah. No, so, I mean, NASCAR was interesting to me. Adolescence is interesting to me. Racing, like, why do people like racing? What's that all about? And also that culture is interesting to me. Like, I feel like the documentary world doesn't know anything about that part of our country and should. And No, yeah, I agree. And so that seemed like a worthwhile, you know, mission to sort of expose our small cultish community to, to everybody else in the no, country. No, that, that's, that's something I want to ask you about because it doesn't, I mean, it feels to me that we're, we, we, we're, I mean, we're obviously, we're, we're fucking insular as a community, like in terms of like each other. But beyond that, like the, the topics that we choose, like the, fa the fact that like, you know, you made a film about like a, you know, racing or something that might appeal to someone outside of like people who listen to like All Things Considered, um, it's, it's, it's like, it's almost it's so, almost so unheard of in our community that, that I'm not making this one about Republicans and, and I feel like I, I'm are people just gonna think like well really you, you and, and like you don't make them look like fucking idiots you know a little bit I mean I, you know obviously there are frustrations with the insularity of the documentary community also I I love this community I mean I I love like going to festivals and meeting all these people whose yes, whole lives no honestly Sorry. I mean. Sort of what you were talking about with Eugene, though, like, we are generally people who make documentaries not for the money, not for the glamour, as right. much as glamorous as, as this crowd is. Yeah, um, it is glamorous. Not all, for, you know, all 18 yeah, of them. I mean, good. and not for the, you know, the, 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 the women and the cocaine and the... It's, like, because people are curious about people and they want to have excuses to go and ask them questions about their lives. So do you think that if, if this uh, documentary festival circuit had existed in the 70s, would it have been nonstop cocaine and sex? <laughs> oh, Esther, Esther already agrees. She's you like, wait, it isn't? I don't know. I mean, it feels like the where, where have you guys there? been? I mean, maybe we're just a bunch of losers up here. Maybe I'm not. <laughs> maybe I'm traveling to the wrong festivals. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Marshall Curry, give him a round of applause. Take your drink, please. Don't forget your drink, Marshall. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I, every drink, every every sip gets a little bit better. Thank you. I mean, because there are layers in there, you know. Mm. You know, the, the lime helped. I, can I have another lime, actually? Yeah, of course. I don't mean helped. I mean, now I'm starting to sound like I hate it. No, it's delicious. I don't think, I don't think either of the guests have liked it so far. Uh, I, this I, think, is, I actually did make this drink for Eugene Hernandez. So. I think this, I think, and, and I think he'll like it. But before, everything, is, everything is balancing on, on Eugene Hernandez. Before I bring him up, I, I want to say that um, uh, tomorrow night we have an amazing show. I know you're going to come back. I will, of course. Because um, uh, Liz Ogilvy will be bartending. She's making the Motor City, isn't and she? She's going to make the Motor City because our lead-off guests tomorrow night are, are Heidi and Rachel from uh, Detropia. They'll be here. Um, the legendary Susan Frumke will be here. Um, Anne Hornaday from the Washington Post well, that will we'll be talking yeah. about um, movies. And from NPR, Don Gagne will be here to talk about what we did over our summer vacation. Wow. So a good show tomorrow night. Um, a lot more ladies. There are no ladies. No ladies tonight. We don't, we're not talking about girls. <laughs> no, this is, this is boys' night. Uh, please welcome to the stage uh, the, the founder the creator, the former editor-in-chief of IndieWire, now at uh, Film Society of Lincoln Center, the one and only Eugene Hernandez. I think Wait. the musical choices of Does anyone, kind Do you of still have your mic? Noise. Where's the mic? Oh, it's in the chair. I was like, that'd be awesome if Marshall took the mic with him and, and let, went over across the street to Chick-fil-A. You were talking about funky chairs earlier. These are pretty funky. These chairs. are amazing chairs, aren't they? They're great chairs. So, how was your day, Ben? You, 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 last night you were with um, with Joe and Bruce. How was that? That was good. Yeah, I think it. I think it went okay. Um, yeah. Did they show the movie too, or no? But they it was just the, talking. There was about a half hour of clips, and, right. and then a conversation. And what? what any any like revelations? Um, was, was there any fistfights between Joe and Bruce? I, I like to, ever since that New York Times article about directing duos, yeah. I like to imagine that everyone is like the Ross brothers and that there's been some fisticuffs. <laughs> well, if there were fisticuffs, I, I think they maybe happened uh, you know, years ago in a, 
editing who would, room who or somewhere. Win? Who in would the, win? In the Joe Bruce's, the Joe Bruce's versus <laughs> Joe versus Bruce fist fight. Who would win? You know, I'm going to put my money on Bruce. Actually, I think that he's. Um, Someone better be tweeting that, by the way. Taste your drink. Taste your drink. Taste your drink. Taste the curry. I feel like the pressure is really curry on huge. Right now. I feel like because you're going to get it. Just a pinch. It's lovely. Yeah. yeah, it's really good. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about you? You had another conversation with uh, Mr. Jarecki earlier. Uh, any, anything? Did you guys talk about capturing the Freedmen's a lot? Or, or yeah, what yeah, was your, uh, a lot about Freedmen's. No, we actually um, we talked a bit about um, this short that he made uh, called Move Your Money. Uh, he was at dinner with um, Ariana Huffington, of all people, at Christmas, Christmas Eve, I guess. Uh, and somehow they started talking about well, I was there. <laughs> uh, well, you were there, right? Who wasn't at dinner? Hey, who wasn't at that dinner? <laughs> what a great dinner that was. Um, where were they? I don't know where. Balthazar. <laughs> oh, <I like> that. <laughs> With the Martha. Good. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, and, and, and they were talking about... Um, he, he's, he, was, he was still smarting over something that Ralph Nader told him, which was, <laughs> which was that, that, his, that his movies... Um, uh, something to the effect that his movies need to make more of an impact, right? And he, and he, got, he really was stung by this, this criticism uh, that Nader, who he likes a lot, uh, had, had leveled. And, uh, and so at this dinner, they started talking about uh, the banking, uh, banking issues, and he decided, they, long story short, decided to make a, a short film, about a four-minute short film. About the dinner? Uh, about their dinner yeah. and it about like a great the banking and how it intersected. I actually want to see that as a pilot. <laughs> so they made, they made this movie called Move Your Money, uh, advocating that folks move their money from um, in, you know, national, international banks to private community um, or small community and, and credit unions. And so he feels that that's perhaps the most successful thing he's ever made um, because it had the most immediate impact. He was talking earlier about how um, his goal is, is, while he's a filmmaker, his goal ultimately is to, um, to affect change, right, and to advocate. And, um, and I think he felt like this short really, really uh, helped him do that in a way that he'd never experienced in, in the features that, with the features that he'd made. Um, so we, we showed uh, a clip from that. It's on YouTube, apparently, so we're going to have to take a look at that. I haven't seen it, but... So you've been in, I mean, Joe, actually, I saw him last night, and he commented on the fact that you were starting IndieWire about the same time that they made Brothers Keeper. And... Um, and I'm curious if in that time, I mean, you've seen like documentaries sort of come to this other, other place. I mean, do, do documentaries have the impact that Ralph Nader wants them to have? I mean, it, it sort of feels like, you know, they have, that people talk about them and, and it may change how some people view the world, but this, this notion of like real change, it seems, it seems like a very ephemeral idea. I don't, I, Shouldn't we just be telling good stories? I think, the, I think the notion that documentaries need to affect change is a lot to expect from a documentary or a documentary filmmaker. I mean, I think that there are filmmakers who, who want to affect change or who, who have issues that are really important to them and that mean a lot to them. But I think that um, if, if we're grading documentaries on their ability to affect some kind of national change or even a national conversation, um, we're kind of expecting too much from one individual film. I mean, I, I personally, um, IndieWire started in, in 1995, 1996, and it was at the LA Film Festival in 1997, I believe, uh, when I saw a documentary called The Cruise, and it's a film by Bennett Miller. Um, and that was the movie that for me, even though I'd seen um, you know, Michael Moore's Roger and Me in a theater, and I'd seen other documentaries at Sundance uh, before that, and certainly films by Errol Morris. It was, it was the cruise that actually I can point to as the film that for me was kind of the eye-opening documentary that, that made me want to explore and, and understand and, and enjoy documentaries as, a, as, a, as an art form. Um, and that film isn't about an issue or isn't advocating anything. It's just an incredible portrait of a, of a really unique <laughs> individual. Um, and so to me, you can't really, at least for, for what I'm interested in, it's not really, I'm not really judging a film on its ability to affect change. It's more on its uh, ability to tell, an in, uh, explore an interesting story, tell a, explore an interesting person. Um, I mean, those, the, that's what's interesting to me about documentary. I just realized as you're telling this that, uh, I, I mean, I was drunk last night, but Brothers Keeper came out in like 92. No. Yeah, the, the and years there's, are there's like, he's completely such a liar, Joe Berlinger. That's not true at all that it was the same time. 
unless five years, what were we, plus or minus five years? 1992. Come on, it's a joke. You can laugh. Jeez, I'm not really saying he's a liar. Go ahead. Um, so is there a question? <laughs> are you asking me yes. if he's a liar? Or is are Joe Berlinger a liar? That's the question. I'm going to defer. I'm, I'm going to phone a friend. Are you going to defer to Ryan? phone a friend. And, <laughs> Ryan? Um, I didn't, but you know what? That film, I'm going to avoid this question. Um, that film actually took place about an hour from where I grew up. Brother Skeever. Yeah. So you knew those guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, okay, so fun trivia. Yeah, good trivia. Yeah. Um, so when you left IndieWire, were there moments when there was a big story breaking in the indie film world where you were like, ah, I wish I was there? Or were you were like, thank God I don't have to deal with that shit? Um, the latter. Um, I mean, I think, the, and the reason being, um, I was thinking about this today. Andrew Saras passed away today. Right. Um, you know, the, the critic who, who introduced the conversation of the auteur theory to this country in 1962. Um, and what I, what I like about, not what I like about Andrew Saras passing away, but what I like about a story that's breaking is the ability to understand it and dissect it and really spend some time trying to make sense of it and what it means to us now or to me personally. Um, and what I was finding at, at IndieWire is that um, in the, as, as the, the, the places that information can be shared um, get, you know, the, the platforms get smaller. Twitter is 140 characters, so you can share information in, in a, in immediately um, in a very short uh, format. Um, as those platforms continue to emerge um, and, and are very, you know, successful and, and, and useful, um, it sort of, it makes it harder to really, um, to enable the kind of thoughtful, long form or longer form um, examination of a topic that I find interesting and exciting. Um, so for then me- Then it becomes even more about speed because you have to have the thing to link to on your Twitter that like, and if you're not out there, then it feels like the whole conversation's already been done. And, and then it's, and it can only be about yeah. like reflection, right? So yeah, and I think that, that for me it was, um, I did that for almost 15 years, and and it was it was it's extremely competitive, and and to try and just play that game, you have to you have to really make choices that uh, make it hard to kind of provide the kind of context and depth context and depth that that I found um, interesting, and so um, it was it was time to make a change for me, and I think it was it was it's been been great for IndieWire. I think they've they've made the right choices, and the people that they've brought in, Dana's great. Uh, Jay, the new news editor, is terrific. Um, but aren't there times when you look at it and you go like, it's, a, it's unreadable. It's what? <laughs> IndieWire, it's unreadable. I mean, like, I, and I've said this to them. Like, it's, it's difficult for me to find anything now. They've got so well, many it's blogs. Gotten so bar, it's gotten so big. It, there's it's, so it's, many it's, blogs it's, it's, and they're like the homepage. I can't yeah. find an article I care about. It's just like, I, I, it's, I've almost given up. And the ad, <laughs> the ad in the beginning, you know, 25 second ad. I know. It's, it's Hollywood. I mean, they, they're, they're doing well. I understand. I mean, I think the don't don't no, you sometimes go like, you've, you've killed my baby. No, no, no. <laughs> not at all. I think the, 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 the baby has grown up and it's, it's a whole different, it's a whole now different. Now it's in the terrible tween? It's a whole different child now. It's, it's 16 years old. Right. Um, it, it, has, it has a lot of interests. It has a lot, a lot more, of, you know, it, it wants to do and, and, and experience a lot more things than it did when it was 10. Um, and so I think that, you know, for me, I actually don't go to a lot of website homepages anyway. I mean, I'm speaking of Twitter and social media, it sends you a lot of my information to... is filtered through things that are being posted on Twitter or, or being shared by other people on on you know Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, Tumblr. Yeah, it's not like you have your like daily links that you have to go to so much. As I mean, I, I just sort of let the information come to me, um, and right. so um, I really, I really don't miss that. Um, that I mean, I I remember being at I think it was one of your Oscar parties, sitting in your living room watching the Oscars and spending most of the evening looking down at my computer right. and kind of unable to really engage with you or anybody else in the room when, you know, um, much of what was interesting to me was the conversation happening around me rather than, than the information I was trying to, to kind, of, um, kind of filter back to, you know, to Other the people. internet. So right. um, 
I respect people who do that, and I, I don't have that same. Uh, I was never raised as or raised or trained as a journalist. It was never really what we sought to create at IndieWire. Journalism was part of it, but but the, the the original idea was was more about community. You were talking about documentary community earlier. It was about filmmakers. It was about um, industry and and film community and trying to find ways that the internet or AOL in 1995 uh, could be used to help kind of connect a community that 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 really didn't have ways to to connect or communicate other than going to festivals. I started going to Sundance in 93 and I met all these cool filmmakers and the only way ever to connect with them again was at the next festival. Um, and so with, with IndieWire we really wanted to create this kind of community. So that, that's the kind of stuff that's the most interesting to me. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm sure plenty of people told you, but I mean, I think that, that, that IndieWire is one of the reasons why I got excited about making films. It's certainly the reason I had a blog and, and, and no, since I had a blog, it's the only reason that I'm sitting on this stage talking, talking to you tonight. Don't you, don't, <laughs> so there you go. Don't, it's don't all you your fault. Mi don't you miss writing that blog? I mean, no, I, I, don't I, miss I certainly it miss reading it. No, it, yeah, I, I miss I, that blog too. I actually saw my favorites, and I go back to it like every couple of weeks, you hoping think, that maybe you, you posted something. something out no, I had a very similar. I had a very similar it. feeling that you did. That when something happens now, I actually feel the relief of not having to sort of comment on it because at some point it, it also it becomes something else that is not. It's not the thing you want. Reason you wanted to do it, which was um, to to reflect on the issues, because now it is so much about like, you know, you can ref people can reflect on things so quickly on on Twitter that the only thing that matters is writing. I think longer reflective pieces that you actually take the time to do it. And I, I feel this way about criticism too. It's like you know, you see people like at, at Cam, they, they've written a review, like because they want to be first, like they want to get it out there, and it's like how. You know, like, don't you want to think about it for a couple hours? Like, okay, go ahead and say on Twitter, like, my first reaction is X, but I'm going to, like, take the next four hours to think about it, and then I'm going to write something. And there's no, it seems like there's no time for that anymore because everything is about the speed of getting it there fa fastest. And, and it's, at some point, it's just like it, it, it consumes you. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly, I don't, I don't expect that it will ever, um, I don't know how it ever, that ever changes. I don't think it does. I think it it requires journalists and writers to try to figure out ways to do what you're saying, which mm -hmm. is to write the immediate response and then sort of come back and, and revisit it. Can was interesting because um, I hadn't I hadn't covered a festival covered a festival in a couple of years and I went back and we're trying to build out a little bit of an editorial component, but a more thoughtful sort of longer form editorial component to the Film Society's website. And, corp and part of it is through Film Comment, which hasn't really existed digitally and will and does now and will even even more so in the future. Um, and so I, I I agreed or I agreed to myself. I guess I assigned myself the task of writing a daily notebook from Cannes. And um, so it was like you know two weeks of filing daily and I gave myself a deadline and I had someone in New York who works in my department who was editing me every day and, and, and we agreed on a, on a delivery time. And I don't know how I ever did that before. I mean, it was really, it was really shocking because I, in just a very short amount of time, I kind of lost that ability to experience something and process it very, very quickly. Um, and that was part of the challenge for me too. Um, Michelle Gondry said at a, at a talk that I moderated at South by a couple years ago um, that um, he was he was asking he was asking kids who who he, who take who were taking pictures at a, at the at the talk that we did at South by um, to consider how the, the impact that that photographing an experience has um, and how it changes your relationship to that event and it changes the way you remember an event because you remember the photos you don't remember the experience um, and and I found that that going to Cannes and actually writing about it every day I, I learned. A little bit about how I was filtering the experience differently two years earlier when I was writing daily, and so writing it daily now, as hard as it was, I hope I was hoping to write from a bit more of a an ability to sort of see what was actually happening in front of me, rather than than trying to feed some kind of machine that like you're talking about. Right. It's something I'm still thinking about a lot, and still trying to make sense of it. But. Well, you know, I actually think I know the future. If you right. want to get it on this with me, ham radio, yeah. ham radio and indie film. I think it's the future. You could have an, an evening <laughs> ham radio <laughs> show, some kind of a... That's true. I could. Cable access, also. We could go back to that. Eugene Hernandez, everyone. Give him a big round of applause. Look, at, he takes Take a, a drink. drink without being prompted.
Well done. Yeah, no, he's he's he on it. He actually likes it. I think. This was delicious. Thank you, Ryan Harrington. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, AJ. Anything you want to anything you want to add to tonight's proceedings before we wrap up? Oh, we can talk about girls a little bit more. If you yeah. Want. So, are no, you no, actually okay. are I you don't. actually watching it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I watched what, the first like four episodes. What is what is your, what is your favorite show of the moment? Um, I'm really obsessed with Game of Thrones right now. Yeah. Um, and I haven't watched the last episode of Mad Men. Um, and I love. Um, well, I hope you yeah. you are not going to be surprised that Peggy dies. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was a good night for everyone. Uh, please, good thanks to Ryan Harrington for his delicious curry to huge. Uh, and, and please uh, join us tomorrow night. It will be a, it will be a lovely night um, with, uh, with Don Gagne and Hornaday, Heidi Ewing, Rachel Grady, and Susan Frumke. And on the bar, uh, Liz Ogilvie, and also a guest DJ, Jason Tippett from uh, Only the Young, uh, who hopefully will be playing right. Selena Gomez, which is the cue to play Selena Gomez right now. Good night, everyone. Oh,